Good morning. I hope you guys recognize how just blessed we are to have our worship team. Amen. Amen. <laughs> guys, I mean, from the piano to the keyboard to the drums to those that are singing, the electric and the acoustic, I mean, I was just sitting there, I was just like, man, we are so blessed, and God has blessed us, so thank you, all of y'all that are part of that. Um, so I want to just, I want us to pray together, and so there's two ways that this kind of works in church sometimes. Sometimes you just listen to the person who's praying, I don't want you to do that, um, or you pray with the person who's praying. So regardless of what I'm saying, you can be praying about the same topic, but I just want us corporately just to spend a few moments in prayer together, and so if you would, let's, let's do that right now. Father, we are so incredibly grateful to be here today. Uh, God, just to enjoy how you have gifted your church. Uh, God, through worship and through teaching and our life groups and the ministries that are here, the angel tree that's blessing families and kids and the Operation Christmas Child, those boxes that are headed out to children all over this world. And so, God, we are just privileged to be a part of what you are doing um, in this world, God, just to be a part of your, your work, Father. And uh, so we don't want to take that for granted. And we just want to say thank you for allowing us to be just a small part of that. And uh, God, we want to pray for our country. Uh, we pray for righteousness among our leaders, um, for those at all sorts of levels across this country, Lord, that they would bring harmony and goodness uh, to our country, and they would lead in those ways. And um, Father, we pray, Lord, for our families, for moms and dads and brothers and sisters and children. And uh, just ask God that as we walk through this Christmas season, that, that we'd be praying for them and interceding for anyone that may not know you as their Savior and as their Lord. And uh, so, God, we pray for them. We pray. We pray for this church and for the ministries here, God, and for the candlelight services that are coming up and for each Sunday that we're here together that it would just be an encouragement to each and every one of us to strengthen us in our faith, God, and just really just set us out, God, on the path that you have for us. And we want to pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so last week we got it started um, over in Luke chapter 1. So here's what, I'm, here's what we're doing, just kind of let you know if you weren't here last week. Just walking through Luke chapter 1, chapter 2, a little bit of chapter 3, because Luke, he, basically he gives us the most comprehensive account of the whole Christmas story from John the Baptist and Zachariah and Elizabeth and Mary and Joseph and Jesus and everything. So he gives us the most comprehensive story, mainly from Mary's perspective. If you recognize, maybe when we go through this, you'll go, hey, Joseph's name wasn't even mentioned. Go read Matthew, okay? Because Matthew talks about Joseph, the angel coming to him and talking to him and him, you know, making all the decisions that he needed to make. So, so primarily Luke is kind of from Mary's perspective and what goes on with the angel and with Mary. But just want to do a comprehensive, just kind of walk through that uh, that story of the book of Luke. And so what that means is that the first kind of part of every uh, message that we've got on Sunday mornings is going to be kind of just teaching, just walking through the verses, and then we're going to dive into just kind of like, how do you, what do you do with that? What do you do with what's happened there? Okay? So I want you to look over in Luke chapter 1, starting in verse 26, and this is where we left off last week. It says, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, so angel Gabriel had come to Zechariah and said, hey, your wife's going to be pregnant. You're going to name him John. It says that God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee. So if you remember, you have Galilee in the north, you have Samaria in the middle, and then you have Judea or Judah, the old southern kingdom in the south area. So Nazareth is up in the, is up in the north. And to a virgin named Mary, uh, she was engaged to be married to a man by the name of Joseph. Now, okay, engagement in the first century is similar to our engagement, but it's not exactly the same. Okay, so when you get engaged in the first century, you are committed to be married to that person. But here's where it kind of differs a little bit from yours and mine. It actually required a divorce to end an engagement in the first century. That's why Joseph, if you go read in Matthew, he's thinking, I'm going to have to divorce Mary. Now, it doesn't mean that they were married yet. They hadn't consummated the marriage, right? They hadn't had sex. There had been none of that going on. They, they were just engaged. They hadn't moved in with each other. They, hadn't, they had no, no relationship with each other other than just kind of on a friendship level. But it required a divorce for that engagement to be ended. And so she was engaged to, to Joseph who was a descendant of King David, which is important because the, the prophecies about Jesus and about the Messiah all pointed to that there was going to come one from the lineage of King David who was going to be the Messiah 
It was going to be the Savior. And so Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. So you have Gabriel showing up, you know, the first couple of verses of last week to Zechariah in the temple. He was there offering incense at the altar of incense. And Gabriel comes and stands the right-hand side of the altar and says, You are going to have a son. Your wife is going to have a son. Even though you're old and she is advanced in years, God is going to come, and she is going to be blessed with a son, and you're to name him John. Well, we know from last week, Zechariah did not do a good job with that, didn't believe him, was like, how's that going to be? I'm old, she's old, this isn't going to work out. And, and so literally the angel said, okay, you don't believe me? Well, you're going, to be, you're going to be unable to speak for the next nine months, and that's exactly what, what happened to him. So six months later, now you find Gabriel, this archangel of God, now he's speaking to Mary in this village of Nazareth in the area of the district of of Galilee. And so here's what happens next. This is in verse 29. Confused, okay, yeah, I understand that. She would be and I would be. Disturbed, you're telling me I've never been with a guy, I'm not married to the guy and I'm going to be pregnant. No, how's that going to work? So she's confused and disturbed. Mary tried to think what the angel, like what do you mean by this? And he says, don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You're going to conceive, you're going to give birth to a son, and you're going to name him Jesus, and he is going to be very great. And he is going to be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David. So there again is a reference to that prophecy that the Messiah, the Savior, is going to come from the line of David, and he's going to come and be given this throne. And he's going to rule over Israel forever, and his kingdom will never end. End. So this is what Gabriel tells Mary. This is how it's going to be. This is who Jesus is going to be. This is what he's going to be like. He's going to be very great. He's going to be the son of the most high God. Mary had one question, okay? She asked the angel, like, how's this supposed to work? Because I'm a virgin. Like, I've never been with a man. haven't been with Joseph. That's not, that hasn't been part of my life. So exactly how, how is this going to happen? Now, the, the difference, and we're going to touch on this a little bit more in detail in a second. But the difference between her and Zechariah, Zechariah understood, but he did not believe. Mary believed, but she did not understand. It is okay, it is okay if in faith you seek understanding. That's not a problem. But, but if in understanding you don't believe, that's where things become an issue for God. And so Mary completely believed. She's like, okay, that's good with me, but I just don't understand how this is going to happen. Zechariah was a completely different story than her. And so the angel replied, because he was happy to answer that question, a little bit irritated, you know, with Zechariah last week. So the angel uh, replied, the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you. The power of the Most High is going to overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy, and he will be called the Son of the Most High God. What's more, your relative, Elizabeth, that means that Jesus and John the Baptist, they're they're cousins at some degree, I don't know, second, third, fourth, first, but they're, they're related somehow. What's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say that she was barren, but now she has conceived a son and is now in her sixth month, for the word of God will never fail. So one of the critical theological aspects of Christianity that you you, you need to understand this is, is that Jesus is fully human and he is fully God. you got to have both of those. He is literally the biological son of Mary, but he is also not the son of Joseph. He is the son of God. He is fully human, and he is also fully God. And the only way for Jesus to save us, to redeem us, for his death to be sufficient for the sins of the world, past, present, and future, is is that he is someone that is unique in all all of history. And so Jesus had to be human, or else he would have never understood our weaknesses, He would have never understood our struggles. He would have never understood temptation to sin because the scripture says that God God is holy. He lives in unapproachable light. He can't even be tempted by sin. You you can't even get to him to have him consider it at all. And so the only way that Jesus could have been led by the devil out into the desert and for 40 days and 40 nights to be tempted by the devil and to be tempted to sin, the only way you do that is he's human. He's fully human. And the only way for him to be able to sympathize with his creation who's caught in the mess that we're in right now is is that he shares in in our humanity. So here's what Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15 says. It says, we don't have a high priest. Jesus is our high priest. If you read the book of Hebrews, 
that's who Jesus is, the high priest. So we don't have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one in, who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet was without sin. And so if you've been tempted to be prideful, so was he. If you've been tempted to go life without God, so was he. If you've been tempted in whatever way, Jesus was tempted in every respect as we are, yet he's different in us that he never, never sinned, never sinned. And listen, Jesus had to be fully human because God can't die. You, you have the infinite, eternal God who he can't die. He's eternal. It, just, it can't happen. And so the only way, the only way for Jesus to be able to die, literally to die on that cross, is that he had to be fully human. He had to pay that price, be our substitute on that cross for us. And so the only way he could do that was to be fully human and to give his life. But at the same token, Jesus was, he was fully God, fully God. The only way for him to overcome all the temptation, the only way for him to live a, a perfect life and a, a sinless life, to actually make it through an entire lifetime without ever sinning, is, is that he be, he be God. In John chapter 8, verse 29, it says, And the one who sent me is with me, and he has not deserted me, for I always do what pleases him. And so Jesus says, doesn't matter what I've done, doesn't matter how I've lived, I have always done what pleased my Father in heaven. He actually pulled all, just like all of his enemies were there, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all those folks, the religious leaders. He says, hey, hold on. If there's anybody here, if, if any of you guys can prove me guilty of sin, let's hear it. Like, y'all, just go ahead. And even the people who had loved to have discredited him in front of the public people who were around, they, they couldn't say anything bad about it. They just absolutely could not point out any sin in his life. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, it says that God made Christ, okay, who had never sinned, never sinned, to be the offering for our sin that we might be made right with God through Christ. So Jesus had never sinned, yet God laid on him all of our sin, all the penalty of our sin. He took that upon himself so that we might be forgiven of our, of our trespasses against God. And so Jesus had to live this sinless life as fully God to be a sacrifice for you and for me, for him to conquer sin, like to be done, like to really truly deal with it, and then for him to be raised from the dead and to be exalted and ascended back into the heavens. I mean, Jesus had to be fully God for that. And, and listen, he had to be fully God for him to do that for us. Because who's, who's going to handle Gary's sin? Who, who's going to handle your sin? Like you can't. And your mom can't, your dad can't. They've been trying to tell you what to do for the last, you know, 20 years. They, nobody can do that for you. But listen, uh, the death on the cross of Jesus, he handles our sin so that our sin is, is thrown as far as the east is from the west from you and I. So that he conquers sin in us. He even conquers death in you and gives you eternal life with the Father in heaven in a newly created body and heart and soul and spirit. And so only as fully God is Jesus able to do those, those things. And so Mary, man, she responded perfectly to what Gabriel said. She said, I'm the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. And so for you and I, that is such a profound, simple, full statement of faith. And it's something every one of us ought to learn. That when God comes and speaks to you about you, about your life, about your kids, about your marriage, about your future, whatever it is, you're just like, God, whatever you want, I am your servant. I will do whatever you have for me. May what you have said and what you have spoken come true about me in my life. That just needs to be our response. It doesn't have to be, hey, God, can you help me understand first? Lord, can you explain all this to me? Can you rationalize it for me? Can you help me get over all my hangups? No, we just, when we hear what God has to say, you just say back to him, I am your servant and whatever you have said, Man, I'm going to believe it, and I'm just going to move forward with it. So there's two things I want to do with, with this section of Scripture. Number one is, is this. I want to tell you how God speaks. Now, for some of you, that might be a little bit of a reminder, and that's good for us to go back and remind ourselves how God speaks. But really where I want to land, and this is where Mary comes in and with Zechariah as well, is what do you do when God speaks? It's one thing to know that he speaks. It's another thing to understand like how God speaks, and we're going to work through that. But it's a, it's a completely different thing that when God has spoken and you know that he has addressed something to you, what do you do? What do you do when he speaks? Okay, so here's how he speaks. Number one is this. It's through his word. We, we have scripture that's been written down for us. 
We've got the Old Testament, the New Testament, 39 books in the Old, 27 books in the New, 66 books in the whole Bible. It took 1,500 years for God to compile all this stuff together. If he goes through that effort to write it down and to keep it together for you through the history of the world and through the Middle Ages and the Dark Ages, I mean, then there's a reason for that. And the reason for that is because he wants you to know. He wants you to know what's on his mind. He wants you to understand how to be right with God. He wants you to understand who Jesus is. He wants you to understand how to do marriage, how to handle your money, how to raise your children, how to get forgiveness of sins, how to deal with it when you've sinned as a Christian. Like, how do I do with that? I mean, he wants, to, he wants us to understand what church is all about and what ministry looks like. He, he wrote it all down for you and I. And so God primarily speaks to us through his word. That's why you need to be in it. Reading it, memorizing it, thinking about it, meditating on it, reflecting on it, being in a life group and church and all those other things. Because we need a lifetime of just submersing ourselves in the things that God has said. And then within the word of God, God has spoken to us through his son, Jesus. If you go back over to Hebrews chapter 1, it says in the past, God spoke to us through the prophets and in various different ways. He says, but in the last days, in the last days, God has spoken to us through his son. So we've got the whole written word of God through the prophets in many different ways. But we've even got the Son of God who has spoken to us and explained to us who God is and what God's looking for in, in our lives. Another thing is, is that God speaks to us through creation. In the book of Romans chapter 1, it says, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made. So you read the book of Proverbs. Solomon is a great just observer of people and things in nature. He likes the ant. Uh, you know, I guess he sat and watched ants around. And he said, look at the ant. He said, learn a few lessons from the ant. The ant, he doesn't have a chief. He doesn't have an officer. He doesn't have anybody telling him what to do. Go do this, go do that. He says, but in the fall, man, he's storing up all of his food for the wintertime. And the ant understands how to do that. He gets it. It's like you got to work if you're going to have anything for those lean times in life. You got to save it up. You got to store a little bit for yourself. You can learn a lot from God about, or, or from the ant about God and about creation. And then he says, Look up, look up. You know, if you had to look at the stars lately or the moon, just go outside and look up and be like, Man, how did all that stuff get there? You know, God put it there so that we could understand the greatness and the glory of who he is and his eternal power in his divine nature. And so God speaks to us through creation. He speaks to us through other believers, your mom and your dad, your friends, your husband, your wife, sometimes your children, sometimes a pastor or a teacher or maybe a life group leader or somebody like that where, where God speaks to us through, through other people. And he speaks to us also through the spirit of God living inside of us. It's that little still small voice that speaks to you through your conscience that says, hey, did, have you considered that maybe like your response wasn't so great? And that maybe you should go back to them and say, hey, would you forgive me for like what I did? I mean, that's humbling yourself before somebody else to say, would you, would you please forgive me for the way that I reacted to you? That, that's tough, but we don't do that naturally. We don't, we don't just think, I'm going to go humble myself before somebody. It's like God's spirit speaks to you, and you're like, man, you feel convicted of it. It's like, I need to go do this. Or God's spirit comes in your life and says, hey, I think this is the way you go this way. You know, and it's not shoving you. It's just kind of, it's just kind of speaking to your heart, saying this is the way that you need to go. And so God speaks to us through his spirit. And he speaks to us through prayer that as we pray and God's spirit lives in us, when we come to faith in Christ, the spirit of God speaks through the word of God and through sometimes the circumstances that we're in to communicate to us God's will. And there's other ways that God speaks, through miracles, through dreams. If you're Zachariah, if you're, uh, if you're um, uh, Elizabeth, if you're Mary, if you're Joseph, then sometimes it's through an angel that God comes and speaks. But God is anything, anything but silent. God's not an introvert where he doesn't want to have a conversation with us. My goodness gracious, look at everything that he's done to try and share with us, like, here who I am. And here's what I want you to do, and here's how I want you to live your life. And so God has been anything but silent. But, but what happens when he speaks? Like, what do you do when God finally and says, look, here it is, and you've sensed that still small voice in your heart, you've read something in the Word of God or heard something from another believer. It's like, what do you do when he speaks? 
So there's four things I want to tell you. Number one is this, is, is at first, when God speaks, you may not understand, and that's okay. But in time, God will clarify what he said. If you go back over and listen to what happened with Mary and Gabriel, she was confused, she was disturbed. Mary tried to think what in the world this angel means by what he said. And he said, don't be afraid, Mary. The angel told her, you found favor with God, and you're going to conceive and give birth to a son. You're going to give his name Jesus, and he's going to be great, and he's going to be called the son of the most high God, and God's going to give him the throne of his ancestor, David. So what was happening here? Gabriel came to Mary, and Mary believes what he has to say, but she doesn't, she doesn't understand it. And so what God does for her is he begins to explain to her, to clarify to her what it is that, that he has spoken to her. And so that happens to you and I, doesn't it? That we, we go through life at times and, and God has spoken to us through one of these different ways. And when he speaks to us, hopefully you believe, but you don't always understand. It's like, I, I heard what God said. I know exactly what he wants me to do, but I, don't, but I don't understand it at all. But here's the thing is that God will clarify those things to you. I don't know how. I, I, don't, I don't know the time frame. For Mary, it was like, here, let me explain it to you. Sometimes that happens for us. It's just in an instant, and God says, I'm going to clarify it. Sometimes when God speaks and we believe, and God just kind of clarifies it bit by bit. You know, it's been five or ten years since God spoke, and you look back, you're like, oh, I, I understand a little bit better now. So sometimes it's not until it's all the way over with, and in retrospect, you look back at what God said, and you say, oh, now I see what it is that God was doing. You know, 23 years ago, Nicole and I, um, we were at a different church. Actually, we weren't even at that church. We'd resigned, and, and we had come here, and I, I'd come to Second, and I'd met with the search committee. And at that time, Second was a lot smaller. It was a completely and totally different church then. And, and I went back, and I was, I was 26 years old. I was married. I had a baby, and I didn't have a job, and that's a terrible place to be. And, and so I went back there, and they had, they had offered the job to me. We're like, hey, we want you to come and be our pastor. I'm like, I had, a, like, scared me to death. I mean, the, the sanctuary and the church, and, and again, it was very small then, and there was still like a, a lot of things that were going on that just weren't really great. And, and so I just, I remember following my knees. I'm like, God, I don't know what to do. And I remember God speaking. He said, Gary, do you remember, like, when the Hebrews, they came out of Egypt and they were going into the promised land the first time? And I was like, yes, sir, I, I remember that. And, um, and he says, do you remember what happened? And I said, yes, they were, they were scared. Because the walls of Jericho were so tall and the people there were really big and there was a lot of them and there wasn't many of the Hebrews. And, and so they were scared. And he says, you remember what they did? And I said, yeah, they, they didn't believe you. And, and he said, do you remember what happened to them when they didn't believe? And I said, well, yeah, they wandered for 40 years in the desert. And I remember it like it was yesterday. God said, are you going to believe me? And are you going to step across the Jordan River even though you're scared to death? Or are you going to have to wander for the next 40 years in the desert? I'm like, I don't want the desert. I don't want 40 years in the desert, so I'm going. I don't understand it, but I believe you. I know what you said. I certainly don't understand it, but I believe you, and so I'm going to, I'm going to trust you with this one. And, and let me, the, the clarification did not happen immediately. It wasn't one of those, hey, here's what we're going to do. It's been one of those things that over time and through different seasons and years and years and years, God has, God has clarified bits and pieces of it. I, I, God's not done. God's not done. He's not done with you. He's not done with us corporately. He's not done. And so there's more to that story that I, I don't know what it is. I just know. I just know that God's going to clarify. So when God speaks, when God speaks to you about your children, and you know that he's spoken, believe him. Understand that clarification may come soon. It may not. It may be 20 years down the road, but you got to trust him. I mean, that's the key to this whole thing. You have to trust him, and you have to continue to follow him during those those times in your life. So if he's spoken to you about your marriage or about a job or about a change or about a direction or about something just in your own heart or your own attitude, your response to other people, you, you've got to believe him. And you have to understand that the clarification will come, I don't know when. That's part of the faith thing. That's part of trusting God and following him and let him be God and you be you and be his servant and praying, Lord, whatever you want, however you want it to happen in my life, then that's, that's what we need to see. So number two is this, what to do, how to handle it when, when God speaks, is you can believe without understanding, but don't make the mistake of understanding without believing. 
Okay? You can believe without understanding, but don't make the mistake of understanding without believing. Because that's the difference between Zechariah and Elizabeth, correct? Zechariah was there. There's an angel of God, an archangel standing there. He knows exactly what the, man is, the angel is talking about. He knows. He understood it completely, but he did not believe it. And he was silent and mute and unable to speak for nine months. Okay? Mary, Mary did not understand, but she believed. And so you can, and it happens all the time, believe without understanding. When Moses was standing up on that mountain and there's this bush burning in front of him, but it wasn't consumed, and God says, hey, take your sandals off, and you're going to go and set my people free. Did Moses understand? No, he didn't understand. He had no conception of what was going to happen in the next few months of his life. No idea. But as he was obedient, God clarified those things to him. And so he had to believe without understanding. Abraham, when God came to Abraham, you remember what happened there? He says, listen, I want you to take your son, Isaac, and I want you to go to a mountain that I'm going to tell you about. I'm not even going to tell you what the mountain is yet, but you're going to go to this mountain that you, that you don't know yet, and when you get there, you're going to sacrifice your son for me? Ouch. Okay, his only son. And so he had, he had no conception. He, he heard God. When God spoke, he believed God because we know it, because he acted on it. And as he was obedient, God revealed the mountain. And as he was obedient, God said, you know what, not your son, but I've got this ram that's caught in a thicket over here by its horns. And he, that ram is going to be the substitutionary sacrifice for your son on that altar. But he didn't know that at the front end. And we don't know so many of those things on the front end either. We don't know what God's going to do. We just know God has spoken through his word or through a friend or through a circumstance. And you know God has spoken to you. You know what he's asking you to do. And, 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 you've got to believe even if you don't understand. You've got to believe even if you don't understand. And in time, in time, God will, God will clarify those things. So number three is this. The, when you believe even if you don't understand, but when you believe and you act on those things, just incredible things happen. The Gabriel comes, angel comes and says to Mary, you're going you're gonna to conceive and it's not going to be a man, okay? The power of the Spirit of God is going to perform a miracle and you're going to bear this child and you're going to name him Jesus and he's going to be the son of the most high God and he's going to take over the throne of his father David. I mean, those are incredible, incredible things. And so she believed and remarkable things happened. Moses believed and remarkable things happened. Abraham believed and wow, did you see the ram that was caught in a thicket over here? I mean, the disciples believed and incredible things happened. They raised people from the dead. They did the same sorts of miracles that Jesus had done. And so when you believe, when you believe when God speaks, even if you don't understand, when you believe God God does amazing things in your life. But those amazing things don't happen unless you believe. They don't happen unless you believe. Here's what Hebrews says about those who did have faith. He says, and what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah and David and Samuel and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms. They enforced justice. They obtained promises. They stopped the mouths of the lions. They quenched the power of the fire. They escaped the edge of the sword. They were made strong out of weakness. They became mighty in war. They put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to accept relief so that they might rise again to a better life. God answers and he moves when we believe even when we don't understand. He provides for you. He handles it for you. He gives you what you need to understand. He, he shows the direction you need to head. I mean, he changes things in our own hearts and our own lives. God does great things, but you've got to believe. You've got to believe even if you don't understand. Here's number four. That when, when this happens, okay, you know, maybe sometimes it's easier to go back in history to a point where you can go, oh, yeah, I know that God spoke. I just want to ask you this. What was your response? Like when he, when he came and he spoke through a person, a, a, a preacher, you know, through the word of God, circumstances, what was your response when he spoke to you? Was it one of faith or not? Now, I just want you to, I'm not trying to like bash anybody. I just want you to think about what was that response because everything hinges on, on that response. For Mary, she said, I'm your servant. I'm your servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then it says, and then the angel, angel left her. So how are you doing with that? Like when God has spoken to you, how have you responded? Because 
don't make this mistake. We do this all the time as, as believers, that we, we make our faith conditional on understanding. God, when I understand it, then I'll believe it. God, when I, when I have one, two, three, four, five, kind of how things are going to play out, then I'll, then I'll have faith. Then I'll believe what you said. That's not how it works. It's not how it works. Your faith, your faith has to be conditioned on when God speaks, you say to him, I am your servant. May it be to me as you have said. And so as we close, here's what I want you to think about. Has God spoken to you about your kids? Has he spoken to you about your marriage? Has he spoken about maybe some, some sin that you know about, but you haven't really done anything about? Has he spoken about a direction you need to go that you haven't gone, that you're just kind of resisting? Has he spoken to you about an, an attitude or maybe a reaction to some people in your life? He's spoken to you maybe about your integrity, about your honesty, or maybe about your, your just thought life, kind of where things are in your mind right now. If, if he has spoken to you, when he has spoken to you, th this is your response. I am your servant. May it be to me as you have said. Don't condition obedience on understanding. Don't condition faith on getting it all understood. You believe God will clarify things in his time and in his way. And so as we close in prayer, I, just, I want you to think about those things. I want you to start talking to God about it and, and let's, let's get it right, okay? So let's do this. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time this morning. And God, in my prayer, Jesus, that, uh, that you would speak, Lord, and when you speak, Lord, that we would recognize that and we would pay attention to what our, our response is, God, that, that it would be one of faith, even if we don't understand, even if we don't get it, even if we disagree with it, God, that we would have absolute and complete faith in you and we'd say to you, I am your servant. I am your servant. May it be to me as you have spoken. And we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen.